Thank you, Pablo, and thank you for um, inviting me to participate in this um, really great event. Um, and you gave me a really awesome topic. Um, some people spend a year learning how to treat hip dysplasia in young adults and adolescents like myself, and I'm still learning. So I'll try to condense all of the most salient points um, into about seven minutes. So hip dysplasia exists as a spectrum and the more severe hip dysplasia, such as a developmental dislocation, usually presents um, and is evident pretty early in life. But the more milder um, types of dysplasia usually take many more years to become symptomatic and may not present until early adolescence or young adulthood. As we talked about earlier, Today, um, the acetabulum grows from three separate growth centers with the acetabular analog uh, early in life, followed by the triradic cartilage being active to um, expand the width of the acetabulum until um, later on in childhood. And then finally, the acetabular epiphyseal growth centers are active in deepening the acetabulum and establishing acetabular version uh, in, into mid-adolescence. So, growth disturbance at any point of any of these growth centers up until early adolescence can result in acetabular dysplasia evident uh, at skeletal maturity. Growth of the proximal femur is also mostly due to the proximal femoral physis, which is also active until early adolescence. And so disturbance of the proximal femoral physis can also lead to um, proximal femoral dysplasia, including coxa magna, uh, coxa valga, coxa breva, and the high riding greater trochanter. Clinically, when you evaluate adolescents and young adults with hip dysplasia, they usually are female, they may be very flexible, and they usually have a family history of some type of hip disease. They may or may not have had childhood DDH. Their symptoms are usually insidious and onset activity related, and uh, the symptoms are usually present in the anterior hip or groin, sometimes in the lateral hip. On physical exam, usually they're very flexible. Um, there's pain with hip range of motion, particularly in hip flexion and with the anterior impingement test, as well as the anterior apprehension test. They oftentimes have a limp as well. For imaging, um, we usually get a standing AP pelvis and measure the lateral center of jangle and the tonus angle. Uh, in dysplasia, the lateral center of jangle, as um, Ernie has mentioned, is less than 25 degrees. And for the tonus angle, we have um, usually thought of it as um, dysplastic if it is elevated over 10 degrees, but more recent studies have suggested maybe a lower cutoff of eight degrees. We also obtain a false profile view, um, which is a 65 degree oblique view of the hip. And um, we can measure the anterior center edge angle and with dysplasia that is usually less than 25 degrees. So the treatment for acetabular dysplasia in the skeletal immature is a periacetabular osteotomy, uh, which uh, Ernie has shared many uh, great examples of the PAO. And it's a very powerful surgery to correct acetabular dysplasia. For proximal femoral dysplasia, a proximal femoral osteotomy is sometimes needed either to correct varus or valgus deformity and rotational deformities. Um, relative femoral neck lengthening can also correct a high riding greater trochanter and any impingement that could be um, secondary to that high riding greater trochanter. Some special considerations in this population, I think, um, include four different um, things. Uh, the first is whether or not the patient has residual dysplasia from childhood DDH, or if they have newly diagnosed dysplasia as a young adult. In adolescence, um, I think sometimes it's a little tricky to decide when to intervene, if they have symptoms or if they have asymptomatic dysplasia, and also how skeletally mature the adolescent is um, that may influence the type of osteotomy that you choose to perform. In adults, we consider their age and the health of the joint and also cartilage quality. 
So when we talk about uh, hip dysplasia in adolescents and young adults, um, with residual hip dysplasia, these are usually patients who had um, an earlier diagnosis of DDH, and um, they may have residual acetabular dysplasia or femoral deformity, and they may have had prior treatment or prior surgeries. So usually the patient and the family are aware of their prior hip issue or diagnosis, and you can sort of jump into um, more of a discussion of uh, treatment options and how this happened uh, with a better understanding um, already existing with the patient and family. Whereas the patient who is newly diagnosed as an adolescent or adult, uh, sometimes the dysplasia may be less severe. So they've had no symptoms for decades and they um, are very surprised that they have this um, developmental deformity um, that has been going on since childhood. And uh, they may have had misdiagnoses or prior surgeries uh, before coming to you. So these patients oftentimes need a little more counseling with education uh, about what hip dysplasia is uh, before jumping into treatment options. With adolescents, um, the symptomatic adolescents with hip dysplasia um, clearly um, treatment at this time uh, is usually considered. But with the asymptomatic adolescence, so this is maybe someone who had uh, childhood DDH that you've been monitoring and uh, radiographically they have residual dysplasia but they don't have any symptoms uh, or it's uh, dysplasia that was just uh, caught on another X-ray for some other reason. And for these patients, um, I think it can be a little bit tricky to counsel them as well. We know that both the severity of dysplasia and activity level uh, influence the age um, of a patient presenting for treatment for a PAO. And so, um, you know, I think counseling these patients about activity modification is important if they're asymptomatic and they prefer to watch and wait. Um, but there may be a role for intervening in an asymptomatic patient if there's very severe dysplasia with subluxation. Another um, thing to look out for is for uh, in adolescents, whether they are skeletally mature, um, if the triradiate is still open or not. And um, your options are typically either a triple osteotomy or a PAO in this uh, gray zone of the early um, adolescent. And uh, we don't really know the answer, which is better at this time, but uh, Dr. Millis and I looked at our patients and between the two of us, uh, we found 13 patients with an average age of 11 years with an average four year follow up. And we found um, in our patients, we had no intraarticular fractures or non-unions, um, but we did see five premature triradiate closures in the operative hip. Uh, despite that, all patients had significant improvements in their lateral and anterior center edge angles and their acetabular index and extrusion indices. And um, this correction was persistent um, through uh, to skeletal maturity. So it can be safely done in the PAO with an open triradiate cartilage, but um, probably in surgeons' hands who um, have quite a bit of experience doing PAOs in the skeletally mature already. In adults, um, Ernie touched on this too, um, you consider their age, the health of the hip joint, the amount of intraarticular damage, and you also have to discuss with them quite in detail their individual goals. So um, if you have a 35-year-old or a 40-year-old with um, um, you know, desires to keep up with her young children, um, you know, desires to be very active and, um, you know, you discuss their function, pain and quality of life goals, what their short-term goals are, and also what their long-term goals are. Some people prefer to just wait and have a hip replacement at some point. So um, it's an individualized approach to counseling these patients. Uh, we know that the 30-year outcomes from burn show the 30% survival rate overall for their um, early cohort of PAOs. Um, but when you look at um, this cohort broken up, um, stratified by age and also amount of osteoarthritis, the tonus grade, um, really you can see that um, the age of the patient and the amount of osteoarthritis are really two uh, strong predictors for um, survival rates. So it's really important to the council patients about that. Um, in general, the younger the patient, the like 
with a higher likelihood of a healthier hip joint with less intraarticular damage. And potentially, they might have a more significant benefit to delaying arthroplasty, especially those patients who are still skeletally immature. For older patients, um, likely there's more intraarticular damage inside the hip, and there's a higher risk of failure of hip preservation surgery. So potentially there may be a less benefit to delaying arthroplasty if they're already in their 40s, for example. So um, we tend to be a little bit more aggressive in saving the hip when the patient is younger and there's less arthritis and um, a little less aggressive with saving the hip when the patient is older and there is more arthritis. So in summary, for the adolescent hip with dysplasia, um, there's a difference between counseling patients and families when there's res residual versus newly diagnosed dysplasia. Um, treatment of asymptomatic dysplasia depends on the severity of the dysplasia and the patient and family's expectations. And the choice of redirecting pelvic osteotomy in the skeletally immature or nearly skeletally mature, sort of in the eight to 12 years old range, is perhaps a surgeon's choice. So if you're like Dr. Liu, who has um, a lot of experience with a triple osteotomy, then that might be his uh, choice uh, of surgery. Whereas for someone like myself, I'm much more familiar with a PAO. Uh, that may be my surgery of choice. Um, and for adult hip dysplasia, I think a PAO can work very well if the tone is greater than zero or one. Um, if there is preserved joint congruency on functional uh, views of the hip on x-ray and um, after thorough discussion of the risks and benefits, if our expectations match between the patient and surgeon. And total hip arthroplasty is probably better if there's tonus grade two or higher osteoarthritis and if there's incongruity of the joint on x-rays. Thank you very much.